seconds to comply. I think you'd better do what he says, Mr. Kenny. You have 60 seconds to comply. This is minute 31. Part man. Part machine. All, All pod. pod. This minute begins with, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and yep. ends with Robocop firing the Auto 9. Yes. This is a kind of couple of cool firsts in this, and it feels weird not having to announce a guest. That's weird. Yeah, it's just we're all alone this time. <laughs> we're all alone. But my first note is Prime Directives! Yes, I want to talk about that. Yes. So I guess we could just jump straight to it. Uh, so there, there's some audio tests done on mm -hmm. Robocop. We talked a little bit about that in the previous minute. Yeah. Then Bob Morton says, what are your Prime Directives? And this is what Robocop says. Serve the public trust, protect the innocent, and uphold the law. Yeah, such a... Ooh, just, just thinking about that actually kind of does send a little bit of a shiver down my spine. It is a great moment. Oh, I'm looking at the script. Mm. Apparently, uh, directives two and three are the other way around. <laughs> he goes, uphold the law and then protect the innocent. But it's, but it's got a good cadence how they do it in the movie. I don't know why. Yeah, it's one of those things, I've, I've definitely noticed that with writing, where you go, mm, no, this name has to come before this name. You know, mm. Hutch and Starsky? No, it's Starsky and Hutch. It just doesn't, mm. yeah. There's um, a rhythm to it. Yeah, and I mean, I've thought about Asimov's laws a lot over the mm. years. Oh, yeah. And uh, there's a good XKCD comic about it that talks about <laughs> which order you put that in makes a humongous difference yeah. in how that AI will behave and what it prioritizes. Yes. So in this case, I'm wondering if maybe this is your optimal set of three laws. And what I mean mm. by that is that it is so much clearer than, you know, not allowing human beings to come to harm. If mm. you say, f uphold the law, well, the law is very precise. So in, mm. in that one sentence, you are leading that AI to a whole other list of subclauses and rules and spe yeah. specificity. And we got, we're dealing with future Detroit here, so there may be things that we don't necessarily know or would consider to be law. Mm. So it's it's interesting from a step. So we have to look at it realistically speaking from a 1980s American standpoint, which is kind of the viewpoint. Yeah. So you know, like we we think law generically as like you know, crime, uh, murder, thief, uh, arson. Although that doesn't seem to apply to Robocop later on in the movie. No. So he would shoot you in the face if you uploaded a video that you didn't own <laughs> to YouTube. He you wouldn't download a Robocop. You've been copyright striked. <laughs> that was not fair use. <laughs> <laughs> so, with the three laws of robotics, now I, I love mm. my Dungeons and Dragons alignment, moral <laughs> alignment. I think that's very useful in, in just story writing in general and psychology sometimes. So, I think that Asimov's three laws are kind of neutral good mm. they are just about the generic benefit of humanity across the board whereas this is what you would consider lawful neutral it mm. is just he is the product of a totally totalitarian <laughs> regime and uh yeah he's upholding the law but what are those laws yes yeah and who is innocent well yeah even like serve the public trust is what very, does very... that mean yeah it's a very broad statement but at the same time you just go okay so how how does robocop serve the public trust <laughs> no. yeah i have actually no idea what that is it just behaving within expected parameters what does that mean yeah i'd probably go with something like that it's like you know like when he's dealing with the kids later on it's like you know don't, don't be like ignoring the children or you know act like a role model but, yeah, basically. Yeah, it, it's it's again, it's it's great. Oh, God, I'm actually really glad we're talking about these because I thought oh, we just did, we're gonna gloss over these because they're they're very iconic. But now we're thinking about this and shit. Yeah, no, this is the kind mm. of minutia I am all about. <laughs> oh, my minutia is yet to come. <laughs> it's called guns. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I did a lot of research <laughs> on on the. Uh... Oh, they gone. Yeah, I'm just wondering. So I looked it up to see if public trust meant something different mm. in America. I uh, don't know if we'll keep no, this in the podcast. But uh, the concept of the public trust relates 
back to the origins of democratic government. Mm -hmm. Whatever trust the public places in its officials must be respected. Okay, that makes sense, you know. You know, people respecting the police officer, you know, that's being held to a standard. That sounds pretty good. Yeah, so it's a, it's a you know, bribery would be against the public trust, political yeah. corruption. Yeah, okay, okay. So that, it's just, it's a term we don't use here in Australia hmm. in that way. So yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Now we know. The more you know. Yeah, I, I, I guess it's, you know, yeah, B Robocop should be by almost definition not corruptible. You know? Yeah. Except for maybe Director 4, but we'll get into that. I was surprised to see that Director 4 was already mentioned this early in the film. I never noticed that before. Really? Uh, no, I, I've always noticed that um, uh, early on. It... I think I was just distracted by the fact that Morton just kisses Tyler in that moment. It's like, whoa, okay. I, I, I do have a big note that says inappropriate workplace behavior. And you know mm -hmm. I'm serious because I gave it three exclamation points. Damn. Uh, yeah, that's... Uh, I don't know if OCP has any sort of... Uh, what do you call it? I guess when you're the VP, yeah. They tend to... Just, yeah. Although... HR is the word I'm looking for, yeah. yeah OCP doesn't seem to have HR at all. They literally murdered no. one of their own employees and nothing happened. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Lawless land. You walk into that building, every man, woman for themselves. Well, I think it's just like corporate, you know, stoogery to a certain degree. You know, this is the boss. You do what he says. As much as, you know, we, we do love Tyler. She doesn't also seem to be, have a negative reaction to it. Yeah, she's like, oh, okay. This is just life, I guess. It's kind of like 60s Star Trek. Well, shit. It's exactly what I was hoping to spare you from where women were treated a certain way, or it's just normal, yeah. <laughs> it does really make this feel dated, but you know what? After finally watching that uh, Our Robocop scene and how they subvert that by having uh, Norton kiss Roosevelt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so good. Still inappropriate workplace behavior, but a nice subversion. No, no, it's interesting you say about Directive 4, because I think it's one of those things where... It, it is kind of a bit of a subtle thing, you know, like... When I was a kid, even I didn't think about this, because, you know, I just didn't think of it in this way, but as an adult thinking about coding, you know, not only is Directive 4 classified in his HUD, that's just a visual mm. thing for the audience. Be Robocop also doesn't go, I have a Directive 4 that is classified and I cannot say yes. it. So, there has to be something in the programming that prevents him from even speaking that out loud. Yeah, uh, whereas I watched the Forbin Project recently, and that has aged badly. But it aged like milk, as they said. <laughs> but it is interesting to see just how robots in fiction have evolved, especially being portrayed mm. on screen. And so the, the robot in that, I can't remember his name, but the AI, I should say. Yeah. He uh, he he just communicates everything out mm. loud in the latter half of the film. The first half is just all text with the annoying clicky click noise. <laughs> it's just like this is fucking killing me. <laughs> so yeah, just have it up on the HUD, and mm. then yeah, we can figure it out. Although I didn't notice Directive Four until now, so maybe not everyone noticed. This. <laughs> That's fine. I'm contradicting my own point. There's a lot of stuff going on in the screen, so you know it's you know. It's it's it, it. I think it's that thing. It's supposed to be a subtle thing that yeah. It, it's a foreshadowing that we definitely get the reveal later on when Robocop finally confronts Dick about uh, the Broderick gang and uh, the Broderick gang. I keep saying Broderick oh, again. Yeah. It's been yeah. so long since Matthew I've said Broderick that gang. word. The Matthew Broderick gang. <laughs> Oh, he is a murderer. Um, oh, yeah, he literally is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> manslaughter. Uh, what was that? Manslaughter. Was vehicular it? manslaughter. Vehicular manslaughter. That's the word. Yeah. Um, uh, so he totally did not serve to... the public trust. <laughs> no. Um, oh, yeah, just in terms of uh, storytelling, because I'm, I'm doing a lot of writing myself, I, there are so many times where you go, oh, am I giving away too much hmm. with this little hint? Or... Some things I write where I go, oh man, this is just going to have so much impact, and uh, people are going to notice <laughs> this particular line, <laughs> and most people just skim over it, and they, it, they, it doesn't register, and then they get to the end, they go, oh my god, I didn't see that coming. It's like, really? Oh wow, I thought I was uh, being so obvious. 
Well, that's that's a weird thing when it's always about any. Or it's kind of like that with any type of art. It's uh, hmm. it's good to put in foreshadowing or at least hints of um, future things to come because then the astute reader will turn around and go, "Aha!" But maybe the you know casual reader might have skipped that thing, or you know, it's like even just like the directive hmm. in this. It's it's such a tiny detail, but it's also not commented upon. It's deliberately not commented upon. You know, so yeah. it's it's one of those things where you know, if you were paying a lot of attention, you 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 get okay, there's something going on here. But it doesn't distract from what's actually happening on screen. Which so uh, yeah, it's subtle but good. I there's a real art form to be able to yeah. Write a mystery or or set up a bit of a you know it's a payoff a setup and a payoff mm. in a way that people don't spot immediately and mm. I I don't really know what it is it's just I, I guess assuming your audience is, is as intelligent and observant as you are yeah yeah um, this is why there's a lot of American like say uh, American murder mystery uh, murder mystery as a genre has never been one of my Big things, just I'll be honest, but then mm. like I've seen like American murder mystery shows, and you just half the time you're just going, yeah, he did it. Oh yeah. The few times I tried to watch Columbo, and it's just like it's mostly about oh yeah, you know who the killer is, and then it's like that doesn't interest me. And I, I finally watched a video essay by I think it was Pushing Up Roses, and she was talking about how mm. why Columbo really works is that it's not about the murder mystery; it's about watching Columbo trap the guy we know who's guilty right and how he does that is the interesting thing that's a lot like luther actually and i have been told that luther is inspired by colombo oh it's brilliant and yeah that's another one where you know who did it in the first Hmm. 10 minutes because it opens on the crime (laughs) but it's all about well how do we actually get this guy because Hmm. Generally, they're doing it in such a deceptive, clever way mm. that you can't just go in there and arrest him. It's yeah. yeah, all that kind of red tape. It's less a detective and more of a cat and mouse. Mm. Well, I guess Robocop's kind of like that mm. too, because we know we know OCP is up to some shit. Mm. So it's just a matter of when that information is revealed and what our hero does with that information. Yeah, like the first, like say half of the film. We know OCP is up to some dodgy stuff, but we don't know the connection to Clarence yet. Yeah. That becomes apparent, specifically apparent, when Robocop finally arrests Clarence Willis the first time. Well, at least when he actually arrests him. Mm. And then, you know, that's when the connection is established between the crime in the city and OCP. Then the second half becomes about, you know, it's what can Robocop do? Mm. So, you know, he he has this restriction. It's really interesting. This must be a lot of fun to do when writing sequels. And, and also, mm. I've, I've noticed this in, in writing fan fiction, you know. So I've been writing this Knight Rider fanfic, and... You look like crap. Fuck you, kid! It's just so... It makes me sound like I'm 12 when I talk about writing fan fiction. I always feel like... But... No, I just, I just realized that technically all sequels are fan fiction. It is. It, it's basically, <laughs> you, you did not create this story. You're coming in there and you're like, I'm James Cameron and what do I want in Aliens? I want more Aliens and more guns. But yeah, so, okay, so in the case of writing a Knight Rider fan fiction, I'm basically coming into a story that's had four seasons of lore to play with. Mm. And so they've basically done all the setup and all I have to do is the payoff, yeah. which wasn't even intended to be set up. So it's, it's <laughs> that's a lot of... So it must be when you're writing a sequel to any movie, you can just go, okay, there's all these little details that mm. didn't really go anywhere. Not that that was a, that was a problem, but mm. now I can build on that. And that yeah. must be a lot of fun. You've got a shortcut in regards to setup. Like, you don't need Robocop 2 to set up another Robocop having to go through you can do that to a degree you can have something like a um serialized content where you know this is essentially what we get with remakes it's basically just trying to go we're just trying to retell the same story and that's kind of why remakes suck yeah (laughs) because they never tend to do anything interesting or new or take a direction and they always remake good movies instead of bad movies friggin remake demon seed and event horizon come on (laughs) 
Event Horizon's kind of got some cult status now, so I'm really surprised they haven't mm. tried to do that. Yeah, especially because there was a script before that uh, by William... I can't remember. But the concept art was by H.R. Giga, mm. and there was like a giant biomechanical Satan, and I'm just like, <laughs> why have we not made this movie? Oh my god! <laughs> oh, yeah. Giant mechanical Satan. You've, you, you've got me with that. Mecha Satan, fuck yeah. That's just the pitch. Mecha Satan. Yeah. I'm, I'm cool with that. Yeah, you'd walk in on a whiteboard, write that up, sold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's pretty much, you know, um, the Reavers from <laughs> Mass Effect. Oh, yeah, basically. Mecha Satans. <laughs> so, Lewis and the other officers are practicing in the gun range when yes. she notices an unusual gun in an unusual hand. So here's where I started to go into it. So we've talked about this previously when we were first introduced to Murphy and Lewis and the gun twirling scene. scene. So Murphy has a... It's the SIG um, P226. Yes, I'm looking at the box of my um, gel blaster replica, so I can see what the number is. And Lewis in that scene was holding, was wielding the HK P9S. It's a, a short, stubbier firearm. P9S just sounds so phallic. It looks like a Walther PPK, so yeah, it's definitely a, a yeah. tinier, tinier gun. It's a neat little thing. I, I like the shape of it. Yeah, but I'm not sure if this was deliberate. I, I'm gonna call it. I'm gonna call this deliberate in universe, but I don't think this was deliberate in regards to. And I can't find anything to suggest there was a deliberate intention behind this, except for maybe a visual one. So as you go down the line, all the officers have got uh, the P9S, except Lewis, who is now wielding the Sig P226. It is a slightly different gun. And that's probably the only... That could just be a visual element to stop... You know, to make sure the camera stops on the right person. <laughs> I, yeah, maybe. Yeah, it feels like that's just a technical thing. They did that deliberately. I'm headcanning it that this is Murphy's gun. Ah. I'm headcanning that this is Murphy's gun. And Lewis has chosen to take Murphy's gun and use it to avenge him somehow one day. Yeah. You, I can't disagree with that. That's canon now. <laughs> that is officially canon. <laughs> so the Auto 9 is a custom Beretta M93R yes. machine pistol. And uh, did, so did you look on the Robocop archive? No, I'm looking at the Internet Movie Firearm Database.org. Because, ah. yeah, I got a few bits of trivia <laughs> about the, the gun used in this film. But, yes, if you want to talk about... No, the only really good note I I love for the Internet Firearm Database is that um, because it fires in a typically three-round burst, the fictional stats of the weapons claim to have an impossibly huge 50-round magazine. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> uh, so they're talking about this in the commentary. Ed and the uh, armorer, Randy Moore, apparently mm. designed this in an afternoon on paper based on the Beretta... Uh, Ed's calls it says it's the Beretta 9.5, but the database says it's the Beretta 9.3R. And yeah. because Paul Verhoeven was originally going to have a Desert Eagle, which they did use previously in the movie, but he felt it was a little bit too small with Robocop's bulky armor. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, because he, he, it's, a, it's, a, it's a meaty glove. It's a real... It's a lovely looking gun. Yeah. <laughs> it's beefy. Yeah. I, um, I, I love this gun. <laughs> it features a longer barrel with an enormous compensator flash hider shaped like a casket, mm -hmm. plastic grips, and taller rear sight to match the raised front sight. Yep. So they really had to just... It, it's already a beefy gun. They made it even, even beefier. Bigger. <laughs> yeah, you can kind of just see where they like. You can, like the If you look at the side on of the gun... You can see where, like, the slider of the barrel is, like, where it was originally and, like, that front end. But it's cool that they basically decided to give it some functionality and give it, a, like, a flash suppressor. So it's a nice, mm. interesting visual image, like, the, the flash coming out the side. Yeah. It's probably functionally not going to do much, but it's cool. It looks cool. 
the rule of cool. So according to the Robocop cast and crew, the production team had to fill out extra paperwork to even allow the gun into the United States (laughs) because while technically a pistol for all intents and purposes, it is a high caliber near automatic weapon, which (laughs) comes with extra legal restrictions, of course. Yes. People have actually made replicas of this and I believe there's actually a, um, not a gel blaster, but the um, airsoft. Apparently there is Mm. an official airsoft version of this gun which we Beautiful. can't import into our country because of our laws. Ah, shame. Yeah, we can't we can't get any airsoft in Australia for our American listeners. So Robocop is only ever seen reloading this gun, well, any gun, once mm. in the entire film. And Verhoeven didn't want that, you know. He wanted yeah. <laughs> this character to be so precise and perfect and all that. And yeah, I have to agree that while generally I like the John Wick method of you count your bullets, you are constantly reloading, that, that mm. it's worked into the plot. If anyone is going to have unending bullets and lightning fast reload capabilities, it's fucking Robocop. Well, there's um, there's that um, what's his, what's his face, um, Christian Bale movie Equilibrium. Equilibrium Gun Carter. Yeah, well, part of it is like you know, his reloading is literally like the magazine comes out of his sleeve and like ejects into it, and they have all these other fancy fancy ways. So. You know, you could probably count the bullets, but realistically speaking, it doesn't matter because it's so absurd. Yeah. (laughs) And I think the absurdism works with Robocop. So I think the only time he reloads is in essentially the the cocaine factory. Yeah, and that's my main issue with people who nitpick movies and say, well, you know, they weren't counting their bullets or this reloading was unrealistic or whatever. It really (laughs) depends. You're totally ignoring the tone of the film. Yes. It would be like watching a Looney Tunes cartoon and going, well, gravity doesn't work that way. Yeah, they fucking know. (laughs) I'm just thinking back to Miguel Ferrier. It's one classic film, Hot Shots Part Du. (laughs) <laughs> and they do a deliberate gag on that where um, Topper Harley has got the mach- the chain fed machine gun and he's just blasting away at everything and it's just got this ridiculous kill count and I think there's another shot where he's doing the same thing and then you cut to a wide shot and he's literally up to hip deep in spent bullet casings <laughs> <laughs> so yeah I need to watch that again <laughs> it's not a great film but it's so fun no, I love it. Uh, and oh, I do love it. <laughs> I will defend Charlie Sheen. I think he's a rad dude. He's a weirdo. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's done some regrettable things. But... but but this was Charlie Sheen when he still had kind of not lost his fucking mind. Yeah, this is pre-Tiger Blood Charlie yeah. Sheen. <laughs> yeah, this is pre-I'm now a TV star and going off my fucking tits on cocaine. I mean, he's probably off his tits on cocaine, but you know, not a weirdo. <laughs> Oh my god, guys, guys, Hot Shots Part 2 is uh, on Disney+, Plus, so get that is in. Is it? Oh, yes. Yeah. I do have them on, I do have them on DVD, obviously. Is it in the first Hot Shots? I don't think I've even seen the first Hot Shots. No, I haven't. Hot Shots is brilliant. It's um, basically Top Gun, done, well, it's not done by the Zuck Abraham Zuckers, but it's, yeah, it's basically Police Squad Top Gun. I need to actually watch Top Gun. I, I, even though I don't, I go out of my way to avoid all Tom Cruise movies except <laughs> for Legend. Yeah, I, I think I watch it. I, Top Gun's a movie I've seen. It's not a movie I care for. It's like, yeah, I've seen that movie. No, just to know the references because everyone keeps making the freaking references. So you pretty I guess much I just need to know. You pretty much just need to watch the flight scenes and the totally no home Folly, Holly 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 <laughs> scene. <laughs> oh, bloody yeah. <laughs> Completely uh, not homo, not homo whatsoever. Maybe, maybe I already kind of have seen this movie via via cultural osmosis. I think that's all you really need to watch because honestly, yeah, the, I'm done. Yeah, the romance subplot I just didn't care a shit about. It's not no. really an interesting film. I can't believe they made a sequel that's eventually going to get released when the Rona magically disappears. Just a monument to Tom Cruise's immortality and ego. <laughs> Pretty much. But this is, again, this is kind of like Tom Cruise before he became peak Tom Cruise. Speaking of characters who are not, yeah. who never reached their final form. <laughs> um, so, the Auto 9 is never mentioned by name in no. any of the movies, but it was actually referred to as such in the original script. And then the name went on to make its way into the promotional materials, games, and comics. The script is so all over the place in regard to these 
two or three minutes particularly because yeah like the whole the gun and the thing are all changed around so i'm just trying to find where it is in the script oh here we are so on page 32 scene 133 robo fires this huge auto 9 surrounded by scientists and technicians wearing hearing protectors Morton smiling has his fingers in his ears. <laughs> that was in the script. Beautiful. Inappropriate workplace behavior. Can't adhere to uh, personal protective equipment. Oh, h &S, yeah. Oh, jeez. He is just a walking violation. How did he get to the top? <laughs> um, Dick Jones maskly screwed the pooch. I think that was it. Yep. <laughs> must be nepotism. He must know somebody. <laughs> he must know somebody. So, this gun has continued to live on in other films. It went on first to appear in something called City Hunter from 1993, then Sin City in 2005, and, oof, uh, before that, I should have said, Dracula 3000 in 2004. So the funny thing wow. is, I forgot to actually open up the bit and look at the Beretta Auto 9. And yeah, it's actually appeared in video games. <laughs> I've played one of those games. I don't remember the... Um, I don't remember that one. Hmm. I don't know if Dracula 3000 is related to Dracula 2000. I mean, oh, it's considerably I worse. I have to look that up now. Dracula 3. The all I'm seeing is the cut one, well, mostly just seeing the cover, and it's this rad Giga esque biomechanical thing, but the movie looks dog shit. So, the promotional photos for the 2014 Robocop reboot that we all know and love it actually does feature the Auto 9 heavily in in the promotional material, but um, never never actually in the uh, the movie. Yeah, I I vaguely recall that. There's a there's a lot in that film that never made it. Mm. Like a good plot. I mean, it's not the most important thing in the world. I would rather it have no references to the original <laughs> and actually be about something and have meaning and actual creative substance. I'm just trying to remember what the gun was in the remake movie. Well, I guess we will get to that when we get, get to, to it, that. although not in this minute. <laughs> Shall we move on to Gaslighting Robocop, or do we have some notes? Oh, I, yeah. I do have one little bit of commentary. Um, it's, it's an interesting perspective. Uh, so in the commentary, um, Paul talks about how uh, the POV shot with the little pictures preludes to the idea of multi-screens and picture-in-picture -picture technology. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't want to call bullshit on that because I don't think it really was bullshit you know, him saying that, but I think it's one of those things where I think picture in picture technology was maybe out around the time this was out. I know like that was a thing that was going on in TV. Humans have always had small attention spans and want as much stimulus as possible, so... Yeah, I don't think he was preluding the idea. I just think it was just an, is an interesting visual imagery that, you know... You know, it's how like, well, Star Trek has inspired certain technologies. Some technologies, they just kind of... It just kind of happened without mm. people even th remembering that Star Trek did that. It's a lovely yeah, little bit of synchronicity. Yeah, I mean, it happens all the time. Yeah, yeah, synchronicity happens all the time with inventions where multiple people were coming up with a combustion engine and yeah. telephones. It's just there's something in the zeitgeist where people need this thing. There's pressure for this thing to come into existence. Mm. Or it's just, well, how else would you do it? You know, I think that there's only so many ways you could do a mobile device, mm. like a phone or a communicator. There's, you know, the flip up thing. That just, it makes sense. Well, the flip phone was uh, directly inspired by the Star Trek communicator. That was, um, the, the guy who well, designed it was, was yeah. a huge Trekkie. But then you look at later iterations of the technology, we've pretty much removed all the Oh, buttons. you say it too. Iter it's actually iteration. Uh, Lindsay Ellis, H-Bomber guy, like, uh, in one day, I was watching both of the videos, and they both said iteration. I'm like, why? <laughs> when, where, where did you hear iteration? It's iteration. It's always been iteration. Like <laughs> Americans. What can, what can mm -hmm. you do? Yep. They, they always mispronounce British. things. <laughs> um... But yeah, technology evolves, which is cool. But yeah, it's uh, I've never had the necessary need to have picture in picture. I really hate it when like a video, 
you know, go small on the screen as well. That just pisses me off. Yeah, and I'm trying to move across to do something. It's like, oh, no, I'm, I don't, I'll just turn it off. I want it gone. Put it away. <laughs> Literally, as I was checking, there's a fucking video popped up on my uh, feed trying to review the uh, fucking Robocop uh, gun. And it's just like, will you fuck off? <laughs> Don't want to yep. hear you, especially when it's just this loud blaring thing of the Beretta Nine AC give you. It's like, fuck it, oh yeah, up. especially when on the on the wikis and stuff, those mm. ones that just pop. I'm not even looking for this information, but if it's up to us and we're controlling the information, then yeah, then uh, uh, having multiple screens and all that, it's very useful. So I just read this thing on the script where it's the you know the card the the map. On the previous minute, it's called the CompuMap card, and the comment underneath Compu it is, "This is the shape of maps to come." Ah. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's all my notes uh, done and dusted for this particular minute. All right. So getting into gaslighting Robocop. Then. Alex, how do you feel? I feel fine, Doctor Norton. This minute begins with Robocop taking his first steps and ends with him about to run through a factory. So this is my, um, note. It's a good thing emotions causes the cybernetics to shut down. As established in this movie. It can't even follow its own rules. Well, the other thing, too, is that Murphy starts freaking out. He chokes Norton mm. and then his assistant just stands there like we just established on her tablet <laughs> she can control his entire body but she's just like mm -hmm. yes <sighs> well I guess my boss is going to die mm. yeah but yeah, do we really care do we do we though <laughs> she doesn't the true hero of this movie yes uh, so the walk cycle is nice, you know, the way... It, it's a combination of physical performance and also the digital yeah. uh, components that they've merged into it, and it feels more like a, a real-world robot in a way that the original Robocop never could, mm. but you know, it does very well considering the time. If there's one thing I can't ding this movie on, it is the special effects for the most... You know, pretty much for the most part. It yeah. Is, the, the special effects have... Definitely had time, care, and attention. And as we talked about in the previous minute, it was Legacy who made the suit. And these guys are, like, top of the game when it comes to this kind of shit. Yeah. So, yeah. It is amazing to me the kind of stuff that goes into costume construction on, that, like, the top-tier professional level. It's yeah. just stuff that experimental technology and really expensive machining equipment that mm. you, you, the average pleb could never even dream of accessing well yeah and like they do a lot of the prototype um, design stuff on the computer nowadays so they can actually test like lighting you know lighting rigs and stuff like that and then just like yeah 3d print or cnc the components it's amazing when cosplayers get it even remotely close <laughs> yes because that's just one person in their bedroom well yeah this is why i think a lot of cosplay is like in many ways, like, probably better in some circumstances than a lot of Hollywood shit is because a lot of the inventiveness of a cosplay at a low budget, you know, it, it's really staggering. And sometimes they do look better. Yeah. Especially if someone's wearing it over and over again, they seem to be able to refine it and go, well, this yeah. actually moves better with my body and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. It's one of those things where if you give these guys... You know, and this is why you know a lot of the high quality or top tier fabricators or guys who become top tier fabricators, they almost completely stop doing cosplay because they're too busy making shit for real world production. Like Volprin props, like he was one of the big guys. He, he doesn't deal with any cosplay now because he's too busy making like really top tier trophies for gaming companies. Oh, cool! Like that's like one of his big things now. He's doing a lot of fabrication, like um, maybe like short runs of like twenty objects, but they're all like really high tier so like the guy doesn't pretty much do any cosplay anymore oh he's the one who did the daft punk there's only so yeah. many people who did daft punk helmets but he's one of the better known ones yeah he was one of the first guys to do the i know he was one of the first guys to do kits of the portal gun hmm. uh he was one of the first guys to you know uh he didn't 3d model it i can believe i think he just scratched built them then started to refine it and, ca and do castings he was one of the top tier uh Daft Punk helmet guys. I'm not sure if... We'd have to ask Goon. <laughs> yeah. that guy, he, he knows that stuff. 
but I know that his stuff is so expensive because it is really high quality and he has like put mm. a lot of time and effort into this stuff. My one complaint about this Robocop costume, and I don't know how it happened, is his arms are too short. Does that bother anyone else? It's all I can look at. Um, <laughs> there are so many other problems with this movie I've never noticed. Yeah. <laughs> Because even if you look at the action figures, they all have this extremely long torso. And if you haven't studied art the way I have, so um, generally when you're drawing a human body and the, the arms are at, just relaxed at your side, it should be about a third of the way down your thigh. So it, your fingers are basically just below your groin, your crush. And Yeah, I'm looking at a uh, concept drawing here, and his, his hands are essentially by his... Like, relaxed are essentially by his hips mm. they're very short and yeah. i the only way you could have done that with the costume is either raising the hip join higher than his actual hip is or lowering the crotch or doing both to the costume okay i'm look i'm looking at a set photo and it looks a bit more realistic like in regards to proportion so oh. it might have just be one of those things they they digitally altered in post yes because because it it does make him look very uncanny mm. but i don't know if it's the right look because the shortening the arms i mean sure tyrannosaurus rex looks badass <laughs> but <laughs> on a human little chicken arms are not quite doing it for me i, I don't know i want to see robo chi robo tyrannosaurus rex in the next robocop mm. movie <laughs> Fuck, at this point, yeah, why not? Anything. <laughs> I, I get where you're coming from. I don't personally see it as an issue, but... Yeah, I guess it's because I have been drawing my whole life, so the moment I see something off like that, just I laser focus onto it. It's... Oh, God. Sorry, I just noticed that fucking uh, Doug Walker's done a 2014 Robocop review. I'm not watching that shit. Hmm? Nostalgia Critic has done a Robocop oh. 2014 I thought review. you said... Dog Walker. I'm like, yeah, Doug Dog Walker. Walker? Doug Walker. I never noticed his name was a fucking pun before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, oh, all these movies are dog shit. <laughs> I'm, I'm keeping it in for that pun. Yeah, eviscerate that man. How does he have so many subscribers still? What the fuck? Because <laughs> people are shit. Oh my, uh, did you watch Folding Ideas yes. channels? But yes, so good. That's I love when someone can just so precisely break down why something is fucked. There's a real art to that. I'll be, I'm more charitable than Dan because it's, for me, the entire wall nostalgia critic bits, what I've seen, it's just Dog Walker trying to basically go, no, I'm great, you all suck. You know? Mm. I'm so clever. It, it's it because it was also produced post uh, not so awesome, so I think it was just like a lot of response to the haters, and it's just it, mm. it comes across so much like a, you know, no, I'm great, you suck. <laughs> he is the quintessential privileged white man. He really is. <laughs> just absolutely no introspection, no self awareness, just absolutely <laughs> deluded by his own supposed grandeur. <laughs> Yeah, so Murphy says, "No, this isn't. This is this is armor. This is this is just something on the outside of my body because I can feel mm. my body." And they're like, "Oh, well, that's actually phantom limb sensation." Yeah, I did love that and, they dropped that into that. Yeah, I think that's really interesting and probably one of the major hurdles we will have to overcome when it comes to cybernetic prostheses is yes. what the hell is phantom limb? I don't think they they know still what it is yeah. exactly and we don't know how to treat it at all no no from what i've read it's like yeah it's they don't know if yeah exactly they don't know what it is if it's a psychological thing like people but yeah reading up about and it doesn't things, affect everyone no but interesting you say it, it, it might be psychological because there is uh well i have a lot of experience with with body dysmorphia <laughs> yes. and it is just it, it's in your head but mm. it doesn't feel like it it feels so real, so I could absolutely well, understand that happening. Well, you got to remember, like, you know, chemistry in your brain is a thing, you know, uh, hormones in your brain is a thing. There's our, our bodies are so weird and 
undecipherable in in so many ways so this is you know yeah body dysphoria body uh, euphoria yeah so i think they do sell the idea of that panic and claustrophobia mm. you would experience of suddenly being put in this totally different body and i have to say the performances are never the issue mm. in this movie everyone seems to be treating it very seriously and they're giving it their all it's just, it never comes together. Do rag on a little bit on Rick Flag, Because it is a bit of fun and we've yeah. got to have some fun with this. But for the most yeah. part, for what he has to do, yeah, it's fine. I mean, yeah, even in this, like, he's showing a bit... Okay, I say he's showing a bit of motion, but it is kind of in the most blandest way possible. Yeah, he doesn't have that quiet intensity mm. that Peter Weller has. There is something... Peter Weller can just stand there and stare off into the distance, and he's just like, what is he talking... What is he thinking about? Oh, this mysterious man. Even that bit in the chair, when he's reading off the directives, and there is something about that scene where, you know, like, you know, you're almost waiting for him to say something else. Yeah. There is something in that. Some people just have that charisma and that uh, uh, magnetism... Mm. And I, I see that a lot with modeling, where models can look amazing in a photo yeah. shoot, but then they start talking or they try to act, and you just go, oh my god, no, you, you just, you, you do not have it. It's a completely different skill set, and, you know, mm. like, no no shade on models, but yeah, it, it, emoting th uh, through... Oh, I think modeling does take a certain skill, yeah. but it's just, it's funny how the media tends to think, oh, well, this model, you know, we'll just use her in our movie or whatever. And so it, it's not the same yeah. thing. You are not going to get that same whatever it was they were selling yeah. in the photos. Getting someone to, you know, pose and, and strike a pose, especially for like a long time, because I'm a photographer. And I know it's not the quickest job possible sometimes. It's, you know, sometimes there's a lot of, like, fiddling around with a camera. And so, and as someone who's been on the other side, you know, posing in a cosplay, you know, and I'm there in an awkward position. I'm waiting for the cameraman to futz around the camera and doesn't say anything and stuff like that. And, you know, just that guy, just take the fucking photo. So <laughs> there is a skill in that. But, like, when there's, like, an, uh, portraying emotion through acting you know speech and move body movement and stuff like that it's a different skill yeah some people can just without doing anything you you immediately you're drawn mm. to them you have respect for them it's just oh i don't uh, jeff bridges is another guy where he doesn't have to do anything you just go he's a really cool guy i just i get this warm energy from that man yeah and jeff bridges is also we we have mental images of jeff bridges but that i don't think any two of them are going to be the same you know it's like it's all like oh yeah you know the dude oh but he was also obadiah mm. stain Oh, yeah, true. Two diametrically opposed things. You know, he, but he's a, he's always a brilliant actor. just very charismatic. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Um, he, he also can so be very low-key. Like, he's low-key hmm. acting. Like, the dude is a spectacular performance, but it's really low energy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> One thing I don't think we've really seen in film ever is what robotic combat would really look mm. like. Uh, you know, if you watch any of those automotive factory robots and how precise they are and they can have, like, a, a center point in their head. Mm. Head. <laughs> they can have this center point and they can move around that with such terrifying precision. Mm. Now, imagine that as a soldier, a Robocop, you know, something with a weapon in its hand, just... You know, the kind of combat you would expect from a robot that's so fast, so precise. The only time we get that is essentially in video games. Yeah, because in the third act of this movie, he's doing all the flippy yeah. shit. And it looks all rubbery and, and, and yeah. dumb. Like, no, it's still, it's still working with gravity. It's still working within the realm of physics. But it is just so smooth. Yeah, when... <sighs> This is, damn it, this is when we should have had Duncan on to talk about animation. Mm -hmm. True, yeah. Because, yeah, this is the problem with a lot of visual effects animation in a lot of these movies is, yeah, gravity and weight and mass is something that really doesn't get counted for. To, to go back to the other popular big franchises, at least someone like, say, Iron Man, not necessarily maybe the later movies, but I think Iron Man 1, 
when you see that suit and it like you know it lands you kind of get an idea that there's some weight behind it and like yeah definitely you know how he lands is so like bang and you're like a yeah fuck that's tough yeah it's like he's flying around something the same weight as a car yeah but then you get other movies where it's just like yeah yeah like the physicality of like you know yes a person can fly but then they feel like you know it there's no the weight isn't there like i'm trying not Mm. to rag on here but this is a great example of a, a physical object having terrible weight that's separate from like the guy with the superpower superman's cape in the schneider films has this own gravity but again so does yoda in attack of the clones <laughs> his cloak flows in impossible ways because george lucas wanted it to be a romantic as opposed to a physic mm. and you can do that if you're doing like crouching tiger hidden dragon yeah. and all that wire work because even though they're moving in this really unnatural way you're doing it practically yeah. so there's still physics at play it's just not the ones we're used to Doing something like that practically is a really good way of adding that physical... This is why we're talking about, you know, in the last minute, especially like a physical costume as opposed to a CGI freaking reference dot sheet. Mm. Paper clipped onto a party part. Dot EXE, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the physicality of, like, a harness changes your body. Mm. As we both know, wearing like a proton pack, you have to kind of work with the weight and that dragging you down. It either throws you upright or forward. Yeah. You can't just kind of stand casually as yeah. you normally would. Yeah. yeah, it's just having this one. It changes your center of mass, so you have to compensate for it. That's why it bothers me that. Well, okay, at least in Iron Man's final appearance, it was basically like a symbiote. Yes. It was painted onto his body, so yeah. that's fine. But when you have the bulky Iron Man armor, but the actor mm. is not wearing anything yeah. like that, I mean, even the gap between your your arm and your armpit, it's not where it should be if you were <laughs> actually wearing, you know, a, a few inches of armor. So to animate around that, they have to cut all these corners. Mm. And, you know, when you're watching a movie like a normal person, <laughs> it's not an issue. But on a subconscious level, you're so aware mm. that he's just wearing a, a green screen suit and yeah. maybe a little bit of foam armor on the shoulders. Again, props to having an actual physical... Because this is the one... Props to props. Props to the props in this movie. Having a good, having something physical and allowing Joel Kinnaman to be able to perform in a physical suit. like. Yeah, I think they did a good job. I, I know I mm. criticized it in previous minutes because I think you, you could go further and do that Alita yeah. Battle Angel thing. I'm glad that there's at least some physical, practical stuff yeah. because that will sell the physicality so yeah. much more. I, I do like to try and, you know, I said, point out the good and as much of a criticize as bad. I think it's mm. one of those things where there's a lot of things we're going to be ragging on the rest of this film, so... Yeah, we don't want to just be bitching about it for the rest of our lives. We'll bitch about the. We'll bitch even more when the black suit turns up. Oh, we will, we will. But for now, I think it's actually it's it's pretty. I like it. It's good. Oh, I do like this costume, and we find oh, this is also the first time we see the helmet um come around. Yeah, so when he gets distressed, it just automatically pushes down. I guess. Yeah, it, it's it's a weird kind of reaction for it to happen i'm kind of glad it does because it's kind of a visual like murphy shutting out the doctors so it is it's got a good piece of visual language yeah it feels protective it feels like yeah yeah getting geared up yeah i do like it but at the same time i still have criticisms of the whole mask being such a on and off thing overall but yeah good usage it, here well if it was done for any particular reason other than oh it looks cool or it's just more practical yeah. you know every i think that's what a lot of remake directors or writers or producers <laughs> overlook is every decision in the original one was done for a reason yes. so the fact that murphy couldn't just pull off the mask symbolically mm. had a, a huge amount of meaning and so when you make a decision relating to that it doesn't have to be the same, if, but if you decide to change it, why are you changing? Not just from a practical yes. logistical perspective. Yeah, I think that's the... Yeah, they, there's a lot of times they just... Yeah, oh, you know, it'd be cool to do this. And it's like, yeah, mm. but why? Yeah, uh, whereas I think... Or we would talk about our version of <laughs> Robocop 24... Our Robocop 2014. Mm. And yeah, I feel like, okay, if it can flip up and down 
there's a lot you can do with that in terms of communicating his mental state at any given moment. So when he does become more robotic, that thing just stays down the whole time. So you can't even read his expression. Yeah. That, yes, use it as a means of obscuring his features, as a means of communicating this is the mental state he's in at that moment. Or maybe, as I said in the previous minutes, you know, have that thing down when he's starting to come out and that's where you get the whole thing of like I'm claustrophobic and maybe it's that thing where Morton mm. turns to the techie and says D um, remove the visor yeah. <laughs> remove the visor you know uh, retract the visor and then the, the the visor retract and maybe that's when we finally cut from like say a POV to a a broad shot or something like that so, mm. give some visual language please it's all generic generic all the way down <laughs> yes. even the shots are pretty bland <laughs> Yeah, it's almost more like a podcast. It, it, it completely fails to do what a movie's supposed to do. Yeah, podcasts routinely fail what movies do. Yeah, no, but that's why I'm doing a movies by minute podcast, because I can never be a director. I don't have the budget. I don't yeah. have the energy or the time. But I can do a movies by minute where I can pretend yeah. that I'm doing just the exact same thing. Um, insert that clip of David Lynch bitching about watching a movie on your fucking iPhone. Now, if you're playing the movie on a telephone you will never in a trillion years experience the film you'll think you have experienced it but you'll be <clears throat> cheated it's a, such a sadness that you think you've seen a film on your fucking telephone get real it horrifies me that you have so many people who watch their movies on on their phones yeah. or on the go. They're, they're distracted, like, oh, I love to watch movies while I'm sewing or cooking or cleaning. It's like, no, no, what the fuck? No, you, you should be watching cinema yeah. in a darkened room with nothing else. You should be totally focused on it because it's not... I mean, okay, some movies, you know, if you just... Especially comedy yeah. or, you know, a light affair... It's not really doing anything too complex mm. visually. Yeah. But if you are watching something like, you know, Robocop, okay, exactly, not the remake, but <laughs> Robocop, the original, visual language to create emotion to tell the story in a way that you're not going to get from dialogue alone. Mm. Yeah, I I don't have, okay, the, the mobile viewing thing, yeah, I think it's a pretty terrible way to watch a movie. I just can't get comfortable doing oh, that. Yeah, me too. I don't, I've tried to watch like movies in VR goggles because like, um, when season one of Discovery first came out, the Netflix was just constantly crashing on the web browser. Hmm. I tried watching it on my VR, and that's the only way it was stable. But like, it just was not comfortable to just kind of interesting stare for like forty five minutes at a VR thing. It was just for me. It was just like ah, uh, just. Because your your head tilts away and it's just not comfortable. Yeah, it's really unnatural. For me, it's um. This is why I listen. I watch a lot of YouTube. You know, it's because I'm doing other things and I, I want to have some attempts. I listen to podcasts or watch YouTube because a lot of YouTube is you know video essays. It's people talking. Yeah, you don't really need to have a look at what they're, they're doing. Yeah, but the one that grinds my fucking gears. <laughs> Is people who read the Wikipedia article and say, oh, I've watched the movie. Oh my god, so my brother is the worst for this, <laughs> where he watches, there's some channel that summarizes a movie yeah. plot, so I was talking about, I love Christine, the movie Christine, mm. I was mentioning it, and he seemed to know all these details, I went, oh, have you seen it? It's like, um, sort of, it's like, what do you mean? Oh yeah, I watched the summer, it's like, oh my god, but you're missing out on like, John Carpenter's cinematography and the music, and just, you're, you're, you're totally <laughs> losing every bit of emotional connection you could have to a film because i think if you write christine's plot down in bullet points it's just like okay mm. the boy falls in love with a car the car goes around murdering people okay whatever what's special no 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 no. but it's like it's a it's the atmosphere and it's the feeling mm. of that movie that's more important than anything else um, so I think my last note was just that the only example we've seen of robotic combat that's sort of realistic, even though it's not even he's not even a robot technically, is the movie Upgrade. I still haven't seen that. That's been my lit watch Fucking list. get on it. Jesus Christ, I've been telling you to watch it for years. But I don't need to watch Upgrade. I've seen Venom. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But especially in terms of the cinematography, 
it, it's just like, whoa, yeah, that's really what robotic combat would look like, and it's very creative in that sense. The only one I was going to say comes close to that was probably, say, like, uh, the first Pacific Rim, because uh, I haven't seen the second one. Oh, yes, one. that too. But the idea of, like how the physics of these colossal bodies a giant object would move you know it's mm. not going to be it's not going to be power rangers it's going to be slow and lumbering and yeah transformers the live action movies have always been so disappointing to me because they're not moving like anything other than humans mm. doing some ninja shit like no i want them to be big and slow but also terrifyingly precise mm. Yeah, I, oh god, I'm really defending a Michael Bay movie. I don't have that issue because for what it is, our perspective should be with the robots. Yeah. Often isn't because it's a cacophony of just grey robot versus grey robot violence, which mm. uh, is its own critique. But like, I don't have an issue with like, fast robot got punch to a certain degree. Oh, no, I think it's either one or the other. Either they're big and slow and you get that sense of gravity, or they're fighting in this ultra-fast, you know, automotive factory robot, scary precision kind of thing, yeah. I did like the fight scenes in Kong vs. Godzilla for that. It, oh, yeah. It's a cartoonish kind of violence, because, you know, it's yeah. big robot combat. But it's like, <laughs> it's it's it doesn't feel cartoonishly fast. It's not like, you know... I love Neon Genesis and Evangelion, but even like the big robots in that feel just like superhuman. I know they kind of technically are mm. half human hybrids. Bullshit Christian imagery. But like, you know, I think it works better in a cartoon, you know, because there's no. Yeah. Again, the problem with uh, real life imagery is that we have reference points. We know, like, say, a crane doesn't move hyper fast it's got motors it's got engines it's got delay so we kind of know what big objects move like mm. and even like big animals don't tend to move fast a lot of that's because of like you know um energy and such you know it's you have stampeding elephants but they're not necessarily bang and move <laughs> you know there's still a pace to them mm. And I think that's something that we subconsciously... Recoil. Recoil is a thing that does not exist in most movies. What the hell? <laughs> yes. Which is funny because um, studying animation, um, like classic animation, 2D cell animation, squash and stretch is a huge thing in that because it's an exaggeration. But it's an exaggeration that helps cell performance. Like Bugs Bunny doesn't just run in a straight line. Bugs Bunny leans back and then propels himself forward. So mm. it's it's visual language telling the story. You know, it's when Bugs Bunny is more realistic. Yeah. <laughs> How many times have we seen that thing where, like, you know, because I think it happens this where, like, you know, Robocop's running and then he takes one step and all of a sudden he's taking two big giant steps and then jumps over a wall or something like that. And it just feels so yeah. cartoony in the worst well, way. Well, it's the landing that really makes all the difference. So we'll get to yeah. that when he does his, his his big old jump. But yeah, it doesn't have the right weight. So I think that's all my notes. Yes. Um, t please tell the lovely viewers where to find you. Uh, you can find me at trivingdesigns.com, T-R-A-V-A-N, patreon.com slash trivingdesigns, where you can get advanced episodes of Alien Covenant, Tron Legacy, and Blade Runner in the Ooh. Nexus Minute. So I finally decided it's called the Nexus Minute, and we will be comparing the 1992 director's cut of Ridley Scott's Blade Runner and Blade Runner 2049. That's pretty cool. Oh, and YouTube, I keep forgetting, so if you want to know my whole life story, I guess, you can go over to YouTube and just look up my name. The life story in multiple parts. Yes. <laughs> Chapters, if you will. My life story is on YouTube. It's, you know, unlisted, but there's like a hundred of them. You'll never see them. Because oh. <laughs> I've never recorded it. Until any. the day you die, there's a, pass there's a password you have to keep entering in every day, but if you don't, then it'll be released to the public. You've just got to give me a million dollars on Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a, an NF, NFT or whatever the shit is. <laughs> My life story is an NFT. Yes, it's about as, yeah. it's about as worthwhile. Anyway. Yep. 
<laughs> Speaking of my YouTube uh, fandom crossing, you can find the vlogs, uh, aforementioned blog vlogs on there. I do some analysis when I'm not podcasting or taking photos. But more importantly, uh, yeah, yeah, Kung Pao on hiatus. Who cares? Go listen to that shit. Um, but more importantly, go check us out on Simplecast, Spotify, Google, uh, what's the other one? Apple, Apple, the one I keep forgetting about. Yeah, mm. write, review, do all that stuff. So next time? My name is Kid Robocock. Ba-ba-da-ba-ba-bang-a-bang-diggy-diggy. <laughs>